Uh, I'm Tim Fry, the director of uh, the Harriman Institute, and I wanted to welcome you to this uh, discussion of legal issues in Russia called Think Again. Uh, the true inspiration behind this event is uh, uh, Kim Martin, who will be here shortly. She landed about, hopefully, uh, 45 minutes ago at LaGuardia and, and will be here. And in talking with her about uh, legal issues in Russia, um, she was uh, uh, intrigued by when I started to tell her about a little of the research about some of the people on the panel. And she said, oh, this is a great idea. We, should, we, we need to get this message out to a broader, uh, a broader uh, audience. So hence the panel. Um, what we'll do is we'll each speak for about uh, 12 or 15 minutes, uh, and then we'll open up the floor uh, for discussion. Uh, you're, you're being videotaped. So uh, your uh, participation, I guess, uh, uh, conveys consent, uh, uh, just uh, FYI. Um, uh, we'll start off uh, with Will uh, Partlett, who has uh, a JD, uh, a PhD in uh, Russian uh, uh, studies. He's currently at the Brookings Fellow and has also spent time at, at, at Columbia. He's, uh, we claim him as, as, as one of ours. Uh, then I'll, I'll, I'll talk briefly. Then we'll have uh, Maria Popova, who has a PhD from uh, the government department in Harvard and is now at McGill University and has written widely on uh, uh, electoral violations and judicial independence. And then we'll wrap up with uh, Kathy Hendley, who's a professor both in the political science department and the uh, uh, law school uh, at Wisconsin and has, and has written as, as much on the, the Russian legal system, on all aspects of it, as, as just about anybody on the planet. So I think uh, we've really got a great panel here tonight, and we're really looking forward to a, uh, a, a rousing discussion uh, afterwards. So uh, first of all, I'll turn the floor over to, to Will Partlett. Thanks, Tim. Um, I want to talk today um, about international limitations on Russian lawmaking, and particularly the way in which the international legal institutions and infrastructure plays a role in actually limiting Russian lawmaking, in particular limiting what I call the rule by law state. So limiting the use of lawmaking to entrench power, the use of lawmaking to create a kind of tilted playing field for um, for the elites in power, um, and a way to, uh, the use of law essentially to undermine political competition. Um, and many call this now, you know, you are saying that law is now one of the key mechanisms in a, in a toolkit of what is being called new authoritarianism. Um, you have the institutions of democracy, so you have elections, you have parliaments, but you have entrenchment of power by a dominant elite. And law is, has become a very, I think, critical um, strategic tool in this, in this entrenchment. Um, so there are two real mechanisms. And the first one is people talk a lot about, we hear a lot about, and these are normal laws passed by the Duma. These are legislative laws. So we can think of libel law as a way of, of undermining or, or threatening journalists who, want, who are potentially criti critical of public figures. Now, we've seen this isn't just Russia. We see this used in Turkey. Um, voter registration or party registration laws. So these can be used as ways of excluding parties from electoral competition. NGO registration requirements. Um, we can think of the foreign agent law in Russia, that probably most of you are familiar with. Um, this is a way of suppressing you know, the ideas coming into the, into the system. And anti-protest laws. Um, and we've, I mean, sometimes they're not as effective as others. So we can think of the most recent uh, Ukraine, the attempt by um, the Yanukovych government to pass the anti-protest laws, and people wearing kitchenware in their head, part of the, uh, the anti-helmet law, which was passed by the Duma, I mean, by, the, by the Ukrainian parliament. But in general, I think a lot of these mechanisms are relatively effective in entrenching power. Now, they're not going to... They're not going to create a fully authoritarian country, but they, many argue that they can play a big role in, in creating semi-authoritarian and entrenching elites in power. <coughs> now, there's a second, I think, type of lawmaking that's less looked at that actually plays an important role, too, in entrenching power, and this is the use of structural constitutional law, um, and, and particularly relationships, structure, constitutionally determined relationships between, say, the president and the parliament, or the relationship between presidents and the judiciary. 
Um, a good example of this is the 1993 Russian Constitution, um, where the structural relationships, if you look closely at them, um, entrenched significant power in the presidency. Um, and they also, another thing they did was they increased the size of the Constitutional Court. For those of you who remember, the Constitutional Court, the Zorkin Court in 1992 and 93 was relatively anti-Yeltsin. So the new Constitution of 1993 increased the number um, from 13 to 19. Similar strategies we've seen being employed by Viktor Orban in Hungary, the use of constitutional law. He's increased the size of the Constitutional Court in Hungary. Also a way of reducing structural checks. So ultimately underlying this is a way of concentrating power using these formal rules. We've also seen it just most recently in, in Egypt. Um, and the um, General Sisi here, who has, who's now running for president, this is a vainglorious <laughs> photo, has, the, the military has entrenched its power significantly in the actual text of the Constitution. If you go and look at it, there's a specific section on the military and the ways in which the military is happening. So Russia, I think, has, um, is part of a general trend here of using essentially formal rules to entrench power, both ordinary laws and constitutional laws. So let's think about the international constraints that might exist on this. Um, I'm going to argue today that the international legal system is far better at constraining ordinary laws than, than they are at constraining constitutional uh, rule by law. Um, and there are reasons for this we'll, I'll get into. Now, why does this matter? So you think of a place like Russia. International law is often not, you know, if, if, if the European Court of Human Rights issues an opinion, maybe it's not complied with. Obviously, now it's very controversial. I'm going to argue that even if there's not compliance, that we see some real effects of the international legal community playing a role in Russian lawmaking. First, there's a shaming effect. Russia wants, desperately wants, to be part of the international community. They've signed on to the European Convention. Um, they're a member of the, they've signed on to the International Convention on P Civil and Political Rights. They claim that they're democracies. There's a shaming effect when this happens. And second, I say when they're international tribunals, um, I think that it also helps to build a public interest law community that brings claims and has, so it has an educational impact as well on the indigenous legal culture. So I'm going to look at two examples to explain a little bit about this argument. First, we'll look at the ban on homosexual propaganda, uh, which was passed just last year in 2013 at the federal level, and then at the most at the ongoing constitution constitutional reform that is happening as we speak, I think is almost almost officially done, which is the court merger that's taking place and the subordination of the Russian commercial courts to the courts of general jurisdiction. So let's look at the ban on homosexual propaganda first. This is a obviously an ordinary law passed by the Duma. It um, could be challenged under two specific areas. First, Russia is a signatory to the European Convention, as many of you know. It is therefore subject to the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights. Um, and I think something like 30% of the European Court of Human Rights cases are all come from Russia. So Russia is a very active, and Russian litigants are a very active play a very active role in, in, the, in the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. Also, Russia is a signatory to the International Con Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and has signed on to Optional Protocol 2, which means that they also are subject to the jurisdiction of the United Nations Human Rights Commission. So, just a real brief background on the homosexual law, uh, ban on homosexual propaganda. A number of these laws have been passed at the regional level, first starting at in 2006 in Ryazan, and the most recent, the, the one that has made the most headlines is the 2013 federal law, uh, introduced into the sections, uh, generally into, into sections administrative codes on protection of children. So we have one of the first significant challenges to this law is a challenge to the Ryazan law. In 2009, Irina Fedotova, who's there in the, uh, in the striped shirt, brings a challenge to the uh, Ryazan anti, uh, the Ryazan ban on homosexual propaganda. She stands in front of a school, holds up a sign saying homosexuality is normal. She's arrested by the police, fined 1,500 rubles, and then proceeds to appeal. She appeals to the, a district court and loses. She appeals to the constitutional court, loses. The constitutional court says that public morality is part of the Russian constitution, therefore this is a constitutional law. And finally, she appeals to the United Nations 
Human Rights Commission. Article 19, and she claims two, two specific violations. First, that under Article 19, that this ban on, this Riazan ban on homosexual propaganda has violated her right to freedom of expression. Um, and she also argues that under Article 26, that this has violated her right to equal protection of the laws. The Russian government, in response, claims, well, this, there's, there's no violation here of the freedom to expression because of the section at the bottom, 3B, that this law is, falls under the exception that, that is there to help preserve public health or morals. And they also claim that there's no problem of equal protection here because uh, homosexuality is not, is not a protected stance. So it goes to the court. Ultimately, the United Nations Human Rights Commission um, finds that there's a violation here. Uh, in fact, in, a, in, a, in what is actually a very important ruling for international human rights, um, um, it, it overturns a pre-existing uh, holding from 1982, which had upheld uh, action by the government of Finland, which essentially banned homosexual discussions on Finnish public broadcasting. So we see a, a pretty important decision at the international level. Irina Fedotova brings this, her, her victory to the Ryazan court, and the Ryazan court refunds her money. So as we, as we have stand now, the federal law, which is currently under challenge, is, has a strong precedent against it at the international level. I can't predict what's going to happen, but uh, this guy, Nikolai Alexeyev, who is also a highly sophisticated lawyer and, and part of the Russian gay rights movement, is in the process of bringing, he's been arrested uh, under the federal law, and he's currently bringing a claim to the European Court of Human Rights. So we see here, to sum up, a, the way in which international tribunals are playing a really important role in helping to, to vindicate and, and to some extent limit the, the ordinary laws that can be passed um, in, in Russia. So let's, let's talk about the second type. This is what I call partisan constitution making. Um, and the, the example of this is the ongoing reform to the court. This is something that Putin unexpectedly um, proposed in June of 2013, which is that subordinating the commercial courts to the courts of general jurisdiction. Uh, just as a brief sum up for those, it's, Russia has three separate court systems. It has, it has a standalone Russian constitutional court. It has a series of commercial courts and a series of general courts. This reform would essentially take the middle court, the courts, the commercial courts, and place them under the control of the Supreme Court. Now, sounds innocuous enough, but a lot of the work that um, Kathy Henley has done has shown that the commercial courts are some of the, are the real highlights of the Russian judicial system, uh, that they're, in fact, have, they've done a very good job of adjudicating business disputes tax disputes, that you actually can win cases against the government in these courts. Um, they're run by, since 2005, by this man, Anton Ivanov, who's a close associate of Dmitry Medvedev, and who's been, who has, um, who, and who has, who's helped push through some pretty significant reforms. Um, perhaps the most important one is, uh, is actually making decisions available online which for, a lot, for studying Russian law is actually very difficult because it's hard to get your hands on opinions. So um, this, this reform, would, it would be a significant uh, loss for Anton Ivanov and the reformers in the commercial court. Um, and as, as the stated intention of this, of this reform is, as Putin and other officials have said, is uniformity in adjudication. Um, they claim that because there's two separate court systems, the Supreme Court and then the commercial courts, that there, that there can be com competing, um, competing precedents. Now, a lot of, there's been a lot of criticism of this report, as I've been saying, and particularly law firms. I think over 80 law firms have written an open letter saying this is a really bad idea. This is going to destabilize commercial law. And most worryingly, this, the new court that is set up that this new unified court, which will be set up in St. Petersburg, will be under the jurisdiction, um, as it's being set up, of a, new, of a judicial qualifications board. Mm -hmm. And this judicial qualifications board will have significant power to remove judges who otherwise would not have been able to be removed. So appointment power here um, will be key. 
So, how, so a reform like this, a significant reform like this, that could have significant powers in undermining checks on, on balances, um, how, would, how would we think about an international solution to this? It might seem crazy, but two years ago, um, there's been a proposal for an international constitutional court. The president of Tunisia, um, this is probably not surprising that this came out of the Arab Spring and the most successful country in the Arab Spring, is proposing that an international constitutional court would be set up to consider these types of claims. So litigants would bring claims and say that the constitutional law, the use of constitutional law is, is entrenching power and undermining checks and balances. This would allow, and I think, if, if this were to be set up, and I mean this would be, this is a, we'll see what happens, this could allow an, the opposition and people to bring these claims and it could have the same effects that the United Nations Human Rights Commission has had. It could help have an educational effect um, on and bringing forth people bringing structural constitutional claims and it could also have a shaming effect um, and potentially deter these types of actions. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish there and thanks for your attention. Great. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Kim Martin, who's made uh, uh, her way here. And again, I want to thank her for being really the, uh, the inspiration uh, for this panel. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to make this size. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the research I've done on uh, uh, Russian law over the last 10 or 11 years, uh, based primarily on surveys of business people that I've done in 2000, 2004, 2008, and 2011. And um, part of one way to frame this is against uh, the common image of Russia as lawless Russia. One of my favorite quotes that uh, uh, comes from uh, Congressman Leach, Russia is a kleptocracy greater than Mobutu Zaire. Uh, we uh, hear often about the dominance of informality in political constitution, uh, political connections, uh, in deciding legal disputes, uh, tremendous bias built into the system to support uh, important constituencies within the elite, and little role for formal institutions. So why do we have this view? Well, because it's true, right? There's a lot behind this. We can all point to lots and lots of cases uh, where of the dysfunctionality of the, the Russian system. So we can think about in terms of human rights cases, in terms of cases where uh, politics are uh, intimately in, uh, involved, where uh, people with a, with a lot of influence within the elites are involved in these disputes, we do see that the playing field is very tilted. We see the unsolved murders of journalists. So this is all there. I'm not uh, denying that at all. Um, but I think it's also important to take into account the law's many dimensions. So while um, uh, courts, uh, have few restraints uh, uh, against um, uh, politically motivated uh, decisions and political pressure by, by governors, by uh, members of the security forces, by people in the presidential administration. Um, and this appears to have grown worse in recent years. We can also think about run-of-the-mill cases where the dynamics might be very different. So here, here's one headline that you'll never see. Uh, business deal completed without incident, right? So it's, it's a little bit difficult to figure out what's going on in these very ordinary firms that, uh, that uh, I've spent a lot of time uh, studying over this last uh, decade. And it's also important to keep in mind that, uh, uh, that there's bias in all legal systems. And one of the things that we want to try to figure out is one of the conditions under which the bias is especially great. Uh, and, what are, and, and what is the size of this bias relative uh, uh, to, to other, uh, other factors. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, legal dualism, which has a long history in Russian law and Soviet law of some parts of the legal system working according to the rules, but other parts being very much subject to uh, political manipulation. And uh, I will uh, use the, 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 the movie titled The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly to talk about three different pieces of the Russian legal system with the good being the, the uh, arbitration courts that, that Will talked about, and they do not work badly, particularly given uh, Russia's peers. Um, I won't talk very much at all about human rights and, and kind of high profile political cases, because I think we all have a pretty good handle on those. I'll talk a little bit more about hostile takeovers, which occur really in the literal sense of the term as the really ugly part of, of, the, Russian, uh, of the Russian legal system. Okay. Um, so how can we study uh, um, 
rule of law and property rights issues for everyday businesses in Russia. Well, we could look at court cases, and of course this is very valuable, but you know, as legal scholars have long known, this is just the, the tip of the iceberg, that very few disputes actually make their way up into court, so we're really looking at a, a very small part of the, the whole picture about um, uh, uh, violations of, uh, uh, of property rights. We could look at specific conflicts, right, uh, and understand those very well, but then we miss the cases where conflicts do not arise, and we end up doing the kind of drunken sailor looking for his keys where the light is rather than where, where they might be, right? So ideally what we would like to do is randomly violate the property rights of business people and then see how they would respond. Um, but that's probably not a wise strategy for, uh, for lots of reasons, um, not the least of which is the uh, Institutional Review Board here at Columbia. So I will uh, talk mostly about uh, uh, survey evidence that I've done. And um, there are pluses and minuses of surveys that we can talk about uh, in, in the question and answer. Um, well, just to give you some sense of the data about how often Russian business people are turning to state arbitration courts over the last decade, we see that um, uh, uh, so on the, the, at the peak in 2005, it's about 1.6 uh, million uh, cases, uh, and it fluctuates then up between 1.2 and 1.6 million cases. So, um, and again, we see some variation in the kinds of disputes between firms and disputes with state agencies. But I think the, the take home from this slide is, um, is the increase in the use of courts um, due to more violations uh, or is it due to the courts working better? Right? We can't really know just from looking at the aggregate data. Moreover, the size of the economy has basically doubled uh, in, in the, the first eight years of this uh, period. So what's the right denominator? It could just be there's just a lot more legal activity, there's a lot more conflicts so people are turning to the courts. But I think one take home from this evidence is that if we have 1.2 or 1.6 million cases, that's an awful lot of cases, I would think. So it's something, this is evidence about the use of uh, legal institutions rush that I don't think is uh, easily dismissed. Okay. Uh, this is just to back up Will's point about the, the perceived effectiveness of courts. This is based on surveys of several hundred businessmen, very much run of the mill firms. Uh, 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 primarily in eight or 15 republics, depending on the, the year the survey was done. And the, the important point to take away from this is that, uh, you know, in each of these surveys, business people rate the state courts of arbitration as a lot more effective than the state courts of ger general jurisdiction. Uh, so why one would want to merge these two entities and give more power to the state courts of jurisdiction is, uh, a little bit puzzling if one is worried about uh, judicial uh, efficiency. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, we also asked business people about the kinds of strategies that they use when they've had uh, uh, violations in the last uh, a couple of years. So I'll just report data from 2005. This is of uh, 500 business people across Russia. And about 60% of the sample reported a dispute that was serious enough to take action. So we're looking at uh, this subsample and what they did. Um, we asked them, how often did you use the following strategies for resolving disputes? Um, and uh, we see that the most common action, whether the, uh, the other side is a private firm or the regional government, is to use negotiations. And then the, the second most common is to use courts. So I guess this, uh, there's been a lot of people uh, emphasis on kind of informal means of resolving disputes. But I think it's also worth recognizing that courts are playing an important role uh, in lots of disputes uh, over, um, uh, and this is true in, in Kathy's work uh, uh, from, uh, from a slightly earlier period, and it's also cr true throughout the surveys that I did. I was also worried that people would be unwilling to talk about their use of other uh, uh, strategies for resolving disputes. So we also asked them not just about their own uh, dispute resolution strategies, but also about how other firms in their region uh, uh, use uh, these mechanisms, and the answers are very similar. So that's one way to, to guard against the, the bias of asking a sensitive question about whether one would turn to these non-traditional uh, means of uh, dis uh, resolving disputes. So the bottom line here is that um, informal strategies of negotiation are widely used, as they are in lots of countries, but courts are also pretty commonly used as well. And although we hear a lot more attention, we have a lot more attention given to people using uh, the security services or other influential business people. This is less, it's not uncommon, um, uh, but it's less frequent than other methods. Um, 
In the same survey, we asked um, about how much did you get back from your last dispute um, uh, using the steps uh, uh, that you did, right? So did you get nothing back? Did you get everything back? Or was it something in between, right? So uh, this is probably a little bit easier uh, in, in this, in this uh, uh, chart. So this is the, the blue line is from 2005. The red line is from 2008. And what we see is that in cases where business people could negotiate, they got about 60% of their losses back. Um, uh, when they use courts, they got a slightly higher 60 or 70 percent back of their losses and much lower um, figures on the order of 30 or 40 percent back when they turn to the security forces or to an influential individual. Right? But the problem here, of course, is that you probably only turn to the security forces and, into, and influential individuals for the most difficult kinds of cases because that, that's a lot more probably complicated and, and risky process, and you can, it's very easy to conduct negotiations uh, or, or go to court. Um, as Kathy's argued, it's almost too easy in Russia to go to court, and this is a, potentially a problem. Um, okay, so um, it's also hard to identify the impact of the strategy, because often the same reason why firms choose a particular strategy um, might be the same, uh, might be influencing the outcome that they're expecting to get. So it might be that large firms are a lot more likely to use courts and large firms are a lot more likely to, to recoup their losses. So we don't really know whether it's the strategy that's being effective or that there are just lots more large firms that are using the courts, right? So we want to try to pull out these different factors to see which of them are having uh, a more or less impact. So one thing that, that we, we did in, uh, this is, uh, I think, the 2005 or the 2008 survey, I'll check in a second, is um, we do a survey experiment. And here, instead of asking all the respondents the same question and getting the average response, what we do is we choose, make four <coughs> slightly different versions of the question, and we randomly assign respondents to different versions of the question. So what this does is it allows us to look at the differences in the responses between questions and see what just a small one-word change in the question can do to people's responses. Right? And this is a very powerful way to control for other factors that might be influencing the responses because on average these groups are all identical. They're equal numbers of big firms and small firms, rich firms and poor firms. They're all exactly alike. Right? Except the only difference is they got slightly different versions of the question. So on average, the only differences that, that, that the differences that we see should be due to these small changes in the question. Okay? If it's not clear, please stop me. But maybe it'll be a little bit clearer when I talk about uh, uh, what we did. So um, we wanted to figure out whether, whether it was better to have the facts of a case on your side or to have good political connections. So we asked business people, um, let's say that your firm placed a large order to obtain a product that you needed and that you prepaid 100% of the price of the good. However, after receiving the product, you found out um, uh, that there was a defect in it. And that it, for one quarter of the sample, we said it would be easy to prove this in court. Right? And just stop the question there. For another quarter of the sample, we asked the same question, but we said, but it would be hard for you to prove your case in court. Right? Uh, then for another, the third group, the third quarter of the sample, we said, however, after receiving the product, a defect was found that it would be easy to prove in court. And it turns out that the seller has good relations with the regional government. And then for the last quarter of the sample, we said, um, it turns out that, or, that the, it would be difficult to prove your case in court and the seller has close relations with the regional government. So I'm, I'm looking in the audience, people kind of understanding the setup here. Then for all of the firms, we said, look, what do you think? Can your firm defend its legal interest by negotiating with this company without turning to courts? And what do you think? Can your firm defend its legal interest by turning to the state courts of arbitration? So here what we're trying to do is to isolate the impact of having the facts of a case on your side versus having good relations with the regional government. And we're gonna look at whether or not negotiation or using courts uh, 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 are perceived to give you more uh, return for your money. Okay, 
So the, the dark blue line is uh, the responses um, when we told, uh, 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 when we asked about using negotiations and not using courts. So the first column, the first two sets of columns here are the cases where we said, uh, you know, defect would be easy to prove in court. If you use negotiations, do you think you could defend your legal interest? And we get, you know, the average response on the scale of 1 to 4 is 3.17. However, when we tell them that it would be hard to prove your case in court, the average response falls by 40 percentage points to 2.77. Right? This is a very large and, and statistically significant drop. Right? So this suggests that having the facts on your side is really important, even when you're just conducting negotiations with the other side, even when you don't go to court. Then we also said, uh, well, let's say you wanted to go to actually go to court. Um, uh, the, uh, when we said that the defect would be easy for you to prove in court, the uh, response was uh, 3.35 here, this large number. And then we said, let's say that the defect was such that it would be difficult to prove it in court. We see a drop of about 22 percentage points, which again is a pretty large and significant uh, 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 drop. Now this is important because uh, uh, I think that the common perception of Russian courts is that having the facts on your side is much less important than your political connections, than your power, than anything else. But this, this suggests, I think, that uh, uh, having the facts on your side is important, which is probably a good thing. Um, uh, I won't go in too much into the other, uh, 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 into the other um, columns because they tell you a story that you pretty much already know. Being well connected is also perceived to be uh, important. Okay. Uh, so the bottom line is connections matter, especially in informal negotiations, uh, but the facts of the case also matter. Also, we see that in all four columns, people expect greater confidence in being able to use the courts to protect their property than in negotiations. Okay. Let me just uh, wrap up by talking a little bit about hostile takeovers. And I use this in the most kind of literal uh, form of the word, and this is much documented practice within Russia of collusion between business rivals and state officials to take over a firm using some specious legal documents, uh, often um, uh, uh, bribing the tax inspector to bring a case against, uh, uh, against, a, uh, uh, against a rival firm, uh, often involving arresting the owner on criminal charges. Uh, Previously, it was possible to put them in uh, uh, you know, uh, pretrial detention, and basically, uh, uh, in lots of cases, this caused the business to collapse. Um, so this is uh, 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 fairly common uh, practice. I have three quotes which, which are interesting about this, um, this phenomena. This is one researcher who says, this is the attitude of the Russian police. If you're still in business, it's not your achievements, it's our mistake. Um, and then this is Boris Titov, who's the ombudsman for the rights of entrepreneurs. And he says, to be an entrepreneur in Russia, it means one must risk jail. Uh, and of course, uh, Vladimir Putin, president of Russia, has talked about extortionists masquerading in the guise of state service. Okay. So we asked uh, our firms in 2011, um, how likely it is in the next uh, uh, two years would you become the target of a hostile takeover? Would you fall under the de facto control of the regional or local government, or fall under the de facto control of the federal government? We had three categories, a very likely, unlikely, and a very unlikely. Um, and the numbers are pretty small, but the consequences are very large. I mean, what we, what we see is that 12% of firms thought that one of these forms of being completely taken over and wiped out was very likely in the next two years. Uh, which, when you think about it, is a really large number. One in nine firms uh, think that they would be, taken, would be taken over. So doing some statistical analysis, uh, one of the troubling things that we see is that it's precisely the profitable firms and firms that are increasing their sales the most that are most likely to be the targets of hostile takeover, which suggests that the economic consequences for this are, are, are not very good. It's not the case of efficiency enhancing hostile takeovers of firms that have value hidden inside them that the new owners can unlock. Right? Um, we also see that managers who are members of United Russia uh, uh, face, uh, perceive less of a threat of hostile takeover, especially from state takeover. Perhaps not surprising. Okay, so um, let me 
Let me just wrap up with this. Um, so I wanted to paint a more variegated picture than the typical undifferentiated picture we have about uh, legal institutions in Russia. And now I want to take a step back. And if we think about this type of legal dualism, it's sometimes thought that you know, Russia's on this trajectory, on this path from the, kind of con the, 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 the absence of the rule of law in the Soviet period to moving forward to the rule of law, and maybe it's backward, but it's this kind of path that the country is on, and sometimes it's a little bit over here, sometimes it's a little bit over here. Um, and that this would account for this legal dualism. But that doesn't seem to be the case, um, I would argue. And also that it's not uh, due to some cultural preference or tradition, although we do see this practice in the Soviet and the Russian experience. But another way to interpret why we have this legal dualism is closer to what Will was arguing, is that this, we can think about an autocrat who wants courts that will encourage business to invest and trade so he can get tax revenue from that and have a growing economy and be popular. It's better to be a popular autocrat than an unpopular autocrat. However, you don't want to give away so much judicial independence or so much power to judicial institutions that you can't intervene when you need to to reward your friends, right? So if we think about a legal system where every case was decided on political uh, grounds, uh, the, the cost of running such a system would be so great that any autocrat would, would find it not all that useful. On the other hand, the autocrat also doesn't want to have a perfectly level playing field and very uh, uh, strong and independent judicial institutions because they want to restrain, the re uh, uh, you know, retain the authority to intervene when necessary. So I argue that there's some po really political roots to this legal dualism that we see in Russia, <coughs> and the solutions to getting out of this problem are really more political than kind of technical or legal. Thank you very much. Um, so it's, it's very interesting that we didn't really have a chance to coordinate but I think uh, um, our remarks, but I think our remarks will um, uh, fit very well uh, together. Um, so what I want to talk about today um, is I'm going to try to play a little bit of uh, devil's advocate and tell you that uh, Russian courts actually have, uh, under some circumstances, produced uh, fairly unpoliticized outputs, even in cases that are potentially uh, politically relevant uh, types of cases. Uh, building on um, what Tim was talking about, um, I'm going to tell you that run-of-the-mill cases sometimes turn out uh, well and uh, turn out um, in accordance uh, with uh, the judge's interpretation of the evidence even if they are potentially political, politically salient. Um, I'll show you some evidence that this is the case, and then I'll offer uh, you a theory about why and under what circumstances um, this is the case. Uh, first, however, I wanted to start with the, uh, with the concept of judicial independence. Um, and I wanted to differentiate um, between what we call structural uh, independence somehow, uh, sometimes, and um, behavioral or decisional um, independence. Now, structural independence of the judiciary um, means that there are formal institutional guarantees that seek to prevent interference by some extra judicial actors in the functioning or in the organization of the judiciary. 
Um, usually, uh, structural uh, independence is associated with some constitutional provisions uh, for judicial independence or statutory provisions for judicial independence, life tenure for judges, um, judicial self-government uh, um, on uh, matters of uh, promotion and demotion within the judiciary, and also judicial control um, over its own budget. Um, the problem with structural independence, though, is that it's really not inherently desirable. Um, there is no reason um, that we would necessarily want to organize the judiciary in this way. Um, the only reason we care about structural independence of the judiciary is because we think, we suspect, um, that it might produce courts um, that will judge independently and impartially. So what we're more interested really in is decisional or behavioral independence. In other words, um, whether the courts can reach decisions according to their interpretation of the law um, and uh, whether courts reach decisions without any extrajudicial actors uh, sort of consistently imposing their preferences um, on the courts. This is, as uh, Tim already mentioned, uh, trickier to measure. Um, it uh, involves analyzing decisions or uh, judicial behavior rather than institutions, which are easier to uh, observe. Um, and even if we have some good measures of uh, decisional and behavioral independence, there's another uh, trick that comes with it, um, and that is that we don't really know when we observe the judicial output, whether politicians um, who are usually the main extrajudicial actor that uh, we think may try to impose their preferences on the courts, we don't really know whether politicians are unwilling to um, uh, interfere or incapable of interfering. And, and that's a, a quite an important distinction. What I'll argue today is that Russia has some structural, in, uh, has a fairly solid structural independence of its judiciary. I'll show you uh, briefly, because I don't want to dwell on this uh, very much because it's not actually hugely important, uh, but I'll show you some uh, graphs um, that, um, that will uh, illustrate, uh, to, or not graphs, but uh, we'll see. Um, some flow charts of how um, Russian judges are, get appointed. And what you see is that there's a lot of input from, uh, from the judiciary in, um, in the initial stages of selecting uh, judges for, uh, into the profession. Ultimately, the president formally appoints um, all judges at all, um, at all levels. Now, compare this, however, to how the system works in France. And you'll see that in France as well, there's a lot of involvement um, in the judicial appointment process by the executive. Um, the, the orange, there's just as much of it, if not more, uh, than, in, uh, than in Russia. And in France as well, we have um, the executive in charge of all the um, eventual appointments. Uh, I want to show you also a, um, uh, the flowchart of a country where the executive has full control over appointments. The prime minister um, in, um, in this country ha receives absolutely no input uh, from either the judiciary or any other uh, institution as to who um, he appoints uh, to the Supreme Court, uh, to the um, federal and tax court, and this country is Canada. Um, so um, when, when we look at the uh, institutional setup of the Russian judiciary, uh, we see that, um, that, there's a, that there's a lot of, uh, that there's a lot of structural um, independence there actually. Um, it is undermined, as we all know, by a lot of informal uh, practices. Um, but what I really want to talk to you mostly about today is, is the level of decisional judicial independence in Russia. Now, we all know that in the high-profile 
cases that we've heard about, there is probably very little of it, none of it. But I want to talk to you about some lower profile cases. Lower profile cases, uh, which, however, are still uh, very much politically relevant. Um, they can, um, they can uh, be politically salient and important uh, both uh, to the regime and uh, to uh, citizens. These are cases in involving electoral uh, disputes. Um, these are cases involving uh, defamation, um, uh, lawsuits against media outlets, uh, corruption cases. Uh, cases of extremist uh, um, activity, uh, cases about lawful pro protest. Um, this is the type of cases that I mean here, some lower profile cases, but potentially politically relevant um, cases. <coughs> and specifically, what I'm going to uh, show you um, is the result of a study that I've done on um, on electoral registration cases and um, defamation, uh, defamation cases um, against media outlets. So let me start with the electoral registration cases. And what I've analyzed here um, is um, the entire universe of uh, not simply um, uh, court cases involving electoral registration disputes, but also it starts with a database of everybody uh, who tried to run for um, the Russian Duma in a single mandate district in, um, in 2003. This is a comparison between uh, Russia and Ukraine. Uh, so uh, it compares um, the two data sets include everybody who tried to run in 2003 in, in Russia and 2002 um, in, in Ukraine in the single uh, mandate districts. So, um, so the, the analysis involves both the decision to go to court and if they go to court, the outcome of, uh, of the court case. So what I've done is I've used a selection model um, to uh, model the probability of success in court for different types of plaintiffs. There are some um, things that I also control for uh, but basically what I'm interested in here is to see if there is a significant difference between the probability of opposition-affiliated uh, plaintiffs um, and government-affiliated uh, plaintiffs um, um, of winning their case, their electoral case, once they decide um, to go to court. And uh, what what you see on the graph here for, uh, for Russia, this first graph, is that conditional on deciding to go to court in the first place, um, the political affiliation of the, um, of the plaintiff does not make a significant uh, difference in, um, to their chances of winning their case. In other words, opposition and pro-government candidates um, have statistically uh, identical chances of victory in court. In Ukraine, on the other hand, you see that, um, that <coughs> uh, political affiliation was a very, uh, a very significant and also substantial predictor of litigant success uh, during the 2002 elections. You see that pro-government candidates are almost twice as likely uh, to win their case um, than um, opposition candidates. And this only involves candidates who are non-viable. In other words, candidates who prior to the election, um, ha it was known that they had very little chance of winning their case. They're basically um, also rants. Let me show you the, the data for, uh, for candidates that had a realistic chance of uh, winning um, of winning the election. Their cases would be probably more politically uh, salient um, to uh, to incumbents. Uh, they would be more interested um, because that that would control sort of who gets um, in uh, the Duma and who doesn't. But you see you see again that in um, the uh, in Russia the difference of probabilities. Uh, between viable candidates is uh, smaller than in Ukraine and in fact is not uh, statistically significant. 
Um, and the difference in Ukraine is, is significantly bigger and um, statistically uh, significant. When we compare, um, we see that pro-government uh, and opposition plaintiffs in Russia have very similar success rates, whereas in Ukraine, again, opposition candidates have a significantly lower probability of winning. So then third, I wanted to show, show you some um, evidence um, that, that indicates that the same pattern, the same difference between Russia and Ukraine holds in another uh, legal issue area that is also potentially politically um, relevant. And these are defamation lawsuits against media outlets. In Russia, as you see from these graphs, uh, the average plaintiffs and uh, federal politicians of all political stripes have fairly equal chances of winning in court when they sue a media outlet. In fact, the success rate hovers around 50%, which is what we expect um, in a situation in which um, negotiations uh, basically fail and you decide to take your chances in court. Um, from the legal, uh, from the litigation literature, there's a lot of literature that expects um, the, the um, success rate to hover around uh, 50%. And this is the case in Russia. In Ukraine, though, again, political affiliation makes a huge difference in, um, in the uh, plaintiff's chances of winning in court. Opposition-leaning uh, litigants have a much harder time when they decide to sue uh, newspapers for defamation. Powerful politicians, sort of central uh, politicians of all political stripes, um, virtually win every case that they bring to court in, in, uh, in Ukraine, uh, which really serves to underscore the political um, dependence of the Ukrainian um, judiciary. So why would why would Russian judges have room for independent decision making in politically salient cases? Um, this is especially uh, puzzling uh, given the comparison with uh, Ukraine, which has a similar uh, legal uh, history to Russia, similar institutions also. Uh, but Ukraine has a lot more, has always had throughout the, its uh, independent uh, period, has had more competitive uh, politics and uh, a more democratic regime. So why would its courts actually perform worse when it comes to independent judging in these types of politically relevant um, cases? What I want to emphasize here is that the limited room for, um, for independent decision making that the Russian judiciary uh, apparently has exists really only in so far as it is provided by politicians. In other words, sometimes politicians are uninterested in interfering or meddling. Uh, they're not incapable of it, but sometimes they're uninterested in, in, um, in doing it. Um, this point uh, was really driven home to me uh, in interviews with uh, Russian judges when I was asking uh, some of them uh, how they, they d decided to uh, rule against United Russia in electoral registration cases? Weren't they concerned about the consequences of such a decision? And they would um, frequently um, just sort of look at me and say, well, I didn't get any signal that I should rule in any way. Uh, so, um, so because I didn't get a signal, I ruled how I saw fit. So there is no bravery here. Uh, the room for uh, independent decision making is provided by the politicians rather than taken uh, by, uh, by the courts. So what I argue is that in unstable, unconsolidated competitive regimes, whether we call them um, electoral democracies or competitive authoritarian regimes that both um, Russia and Ukraine um, are, increased uncertainty uh, for the incumbent actually strengthens their interest and their need to use the courts as an instrument that could help them fend off challengers and remain in power. So when political competition intensifies, 
the interest of uh, the incumbent in interfering and circumscribing this, this room for independent judges judging um, increases dramatically. Uh, when they are threatened, they, are inter they become interested in um, more cases and they lean on the courts more frequently to obtain favorable rulings. But secure incumbents, like Putin was in the 2000s when uh, most of this uh, data uh, that I have here was collected, um, have less of an interest in using the courts and therefore provide wider room for independent um, judging. So finally, I just uh, briefly wanted to tell you um, how I'm expanding um, this uh, research. I'm currently wrapping up extending the defamation um, lawsuit data set uh, to include uh, defamation uh, lawsuits from 2004 to 2012. So now I have a, a, a set of uh, defamation cases uh, from 97 to 2012. Um, and the preliminary um, results, uh, what, what I'll try to do with this uh, data would be to try to see uh, patterns over time as um, uh, sort of com the security of incumbents in Russia as well sort of varies over time to see if that is reflected in, um, in the uh, defamation um, lawsuit data. In addition, I, I wanted to give you uh, a little um, anecdotal uh, s sort of support for the hypothesis that increased political competition um, <coughs> or challenge to the incumbents may actually result um, in them reaching for uh, the courts as an instrument uh, for settling political scores. And I wanted to compare here uh, for you the, the case of um, a prosecution against uh, Vaina, the art group in, uh, in which uh, uh, Nadezhda Dalkonikova uh, was part of before uh, she was part of Pussy Riot. So I wanted to contrast the Vaina case versus the Pussy Riot case. Now, in, um, as many of you probably know, in 2008, uh, the art group uh, Vaina was involved in an uh, arguably more offensive uh, stunt to public morality than, um, than the uh, punk prayer in the cathedral. Um, and as a result of the, the uh, stunt in the Museum of, uh, uh, of Biology, um, they were actually prosecuted under the exact same Article 213 um, of the Criminal Code. They were uh, prosecuted for hooliganism. Uh, in the context, um, <coughs> I argue, though, of, of the regime's higher stability um, at that time, it seems that the case simply did not attract any attention uh, from uh, politicians and did not become politicized. And as a result, the case was ultimately dismissed. Um, the, the Russian courts uh, did not pursue this uh, uh, case further and uh, the charges were dropped before the case um, uh, could go to trial. In the spring of 2012, however, in the context of um, the protests against uh, the Putin regime that had just happened in uh, December of 2011 and in the context of the changeover um, uh, that was about to happen in uh, March of uh, 2012, uh, the, the stunt in the cathedral attracted uh, a virtually identical uh, case, attracted uh, political attention sped through the courts, and uh, we all know uh, how that um, ended for Pussy Riot. Okay. Now we'll hear from uh, Kathy Henley from the University of Wisconsin, and who we should all thank for being the foundation okay. of all, all of our work as yeah. well. 
and who's also performing with one hand, so uh, she gets extra points. Uh -huh. um, well, I wanted to thank Kim for organizing this, and I think it's particularly appropriate to have it here at Columbia. Uh, some of us are old enough to remember John Hazard, who is really the pioneer of all this work, and uh, uh, one of my favorite articles that he wrote uh, tells us something about the whole question of access, which none of us have really talked about, but is the bane of our existence. And he wrote this wonderful article where he uh, talked about what you could tell from the placement of the furniture in courtrooms, because that's all he could see. Right? That's all they let him see. And so it's a lesson to all of us that you do what you can with what you can, what you can get, mm -hmm. and not to beat ourselves up about what we can't do, because there's a lot that we can't do uh, compared to what, say, Americanists uh, can do. Uh, so we all seem to be competing here to be the, the devil's advocate. And so I will, I will join the competition and, and begin with uh, this slide, which gives us, the, in some ways, the traditional story of what we think we know about courts. And this is uh, data from the quite well-respected Levada Institute, and uh, where, he, uh, where they go in and they ask, uh, what do people think about different kinds of institutions and lots of other institutions? But one of the problems with this sort of question uh, in Russia is, what does it mean to ask about the courts? Uh, we have different kinds of courts. We have different contexts in which people experience courts. What are we getting with this question? Um, and so what I've found in my work is that what we're seeing here is maybe a knee-jerk reaction to what people think about law and courts. And then when you probe a little bit deep, deeper, what you get is a much richer story from individuals, from firms, uh, uh, both on an individual and an aggregate basis. And so I want to echo what Tim was saying about dualism and suggest that it, from that nugget that we get from Ernst Frankel's work about Nazi Germany, uh, Nazi Germany and the idea of there being obviously a lot of bad stuff that was going on there and then a lot of mundane, ordinary stuff, is that I think what we're all kind of pushing for here is a recognition of multiple narratives of law in Russia. We accept multiple narratives of law in our own countries and somehow at least in the, you know, kind of the uh, common wisdom of what we think we know about Russia, we seem to only accept one narrative of law, which is this highly politicized uh, pussy riot, Hodorkovsky kind of story, uh, all of which is true, and nobody would deny that that's not true. And I think one of the, uh, the issues that we have is how do we uh, uh, then uh, go from recognizing the reality to theorizing about it? How do we deal with countries uh, like, like Russia, like China, like lots and lots of countries um, that have these cases that are politicized uh, and ca cases in which corruption uh, is part of the story, which I think is probably more the hostile takeover piece than, than the politics of it. Um, and, uh, and so how do we think about that? And how do we deal with that with this rule of law, uh, you know, kind of juggernaut uh, that has been created by the World Bank and others who have these, you know, seem to have an endless supply of indices which push you down to the bottom of the index if you have any sort of politicized justice, right? Um, and, you know, my argument is that the, these, these indices tend to preference what we do best uh, and not pay much attention to what we do badly. So if we apply that to, say, the comparison of the United States and, and, and Russia, uh, the United States has depending on how we think about money as a political issue, we, we usually kind of you know, don't, don't pay attention to the way in which uh, people are sidelined because of their lack of resources. Um, and so we, we would argue that the United States is not a terribly politicized system, but it is a, a system that has remarkably poor access uh, to justice. Uh, whereas Russia, you might flip it and you might say, okay, a lot, a, a lot we don't really know. And that's another part of the problem is it's hard to get our hands around what is the this sphere of cases that are, are being manipulated by, whether through corruption, whether through politics, whatever. Um, but access is, is remarkable, and that's a, a story that I want to fill in the gaps on here tonight. Um, so in a way, that's what I want to do, is just kind of to tell a little bit of the, uh, maybe some, a few things that have been uh, left out of the story. Uh, and here's one thing that we've already talked a little bit about, and so here we see a very simple uh, hierarchy, and so I've drawn a little dotted line around these two courts that are uh, going to be joined together. And I think the question is about this is, is ultimately unknowable at this point, because we do not understand what, the, what it's going to be like when they're together. I mean, in, in reality, you could imagine a situation where they essentially create a sastav, uh, you know, a separate part that, that deals with arbitrage stuff. And then, you know, for all, uh, for a lot of purposes, it, it's not really going to change that much. 
Um, uh, but one of the things that you might lose with that is the right of legislative initiative that the uh, higher arbitrage court has right now. And one of the things that has been quite remarkable about the arbitrage courts and really about the entire judicial system is the level of institutional experimentation and institutional growth that has gone on in the post-Soviet period. Um, and I'd be happy to talk more about that, but the, a nice example of it that I'm going to definitely talk about are the Justice of the Peace Courts that are part of the Courts of General uh, Jurisdiction. Um, but the Higher Arbitrage Court has been particularly active in putting forward uh, new ideas. A lot of these are, are sort of technical procedural issues, um, but they have uh, uh, are um, uh, very experimental and uh, don't fit with the normal picture, which is this kind of relentlessly top-down, you know, we're not interested in new ideas or anything like that, and I think that's not really part of what we're seeing. Um, so Tim had talked a little bit about the, the use of the arbitrage courts, and here's a, uh, a little bit of data about the use of the courts of general jurisdiction. And the reason I like this particular slide is that when I just give the general numbers, people automatically assume, well, the story is criminal cases. Of course, in an in a oppressive regime like uh, Putin's, uh, there would be lots of cases, but they would all be criminal. And you see that the growth is not in criminal cases, that the growth is in civil cases. And civil cases are interesting because at least one person involved in that case has to want to be there, right? In criminal cases, they don't really want to be there, right? And civil cases are interesting, and that's why I mostly study civil cases, is because they're, you're, at least somebody is there voluntarily, and they're making a choice uh, to use the courts, which is, uh, which is very um, interesting for us. Um, and I wanted to show you a little bit of data from the uh, judicial department that's still in the Russian, uh, just to show you the evolution of the, uh, of the um, uh, Justice of the Peace Courts. So here we see, uh, and this only goes up to 2007, but the, uh, the um, Justice of the Peace Courts were authorized in 1998. So you see there, we can really watch in the ways in which the, the, the shift has gone from cases coming into the system at the district court level as opposed to coming into the courts through the Justice of the Peace Court. So it's fair to say when you look at this, and so the, uh, the, the, the navy blue is the um, Justice of the Peace Courts, and you can watch how it increases there. And so what you can see here in the civil cases is that uh, for 75% of the cases that come into the civil courts, the Justice of the Peace Courts, a court that didn't exist you know, until around 2001, 2002, is now the portal of entry, you know, which is a remarkable institutional change uh, in the sort of the lower level, the ordinary case world of the, um, of the courts. And here we see it for criminal cases, less effect because of the nature of the jurisdiction of the uh, Justice of the Peace Courts. They handle criminal cases where the uh, you have a possibility of three years of imprisonment, so that's a much smaller universe of cases. And it's most dramatic with regard to administrative cases, which is an odd, it doesn't, you can't really, it's not a literal translation of administrative cases. These are cases that involve the state, uh, tax cases, traffic cases, that sort of thing. And you can see that 95% uh, of these cases enter through the, um, the uh, Justice of the Peace Courts. And I thought it might be interesting for those of us that don't spend their, their summers and uh, some of their winters hanging out in courts, uh, to see what they look like, because maybe not all of us have had this experience. So here we see uh, some pictures of the Justice of the Peace Courts. And I think what's interesting is that, you know, not all of them have this, but we see at least a couple courts in Moscow that have the uh, handicapped accessible ramps, which is, you know, sort of uh, unexpected in, the, uh, um, uh, uh, in Russia in general. Uh, having traveled there once with a broken leg, I can uh, attest to the lack of accommodations for people who can't walk. And so the, and I actually have uh, like uh, hundreds of these slides. So when I do my own presentation, I usually start with like a, an endless loop of these. And the, the beauty of it is, is that people tell me that once you, you start to see all of them, you just get the stench of the, the linoleum that is there, right? <laughs> and so, you know, what you see here is, is not the kind of, of um, you know, mahogany uh, that we see in our courts, but more of a, a kind of bureaucratic civil service functionality uh, to it. And then over in the far corner there, you see the information uh, bulletin boards, which is a, you know, something that they had in the Soviet period as well. And as somebody was mentioning, one of the, in, the um, innovations of recent years, which is something that comes out of a push from the Strasbourg court, is that all courts now have uh, websites. The arbitrage court websites are a thousand times better than the courts of general jurisdiction. But the reality is, is that a lot of these websites have 
uh, even for the courts of general jurisdiction, have a huge amount of information that used to only be available, you know, sort of if you go and, and copy things down. Uh, and then here we see some images from Yekaterinburg. Um, and the, the Justice of the Peace Courts are interesting because they tend to be nestled, you know, right into uh, residential uh, areas. And the original idea of them was is that they would be kind of a community court. And I think the realities of Russian real estate have made that less possible than they thought uh, originally, at least in urban areas, uh, more possible in rural areas. Um, uh, and then uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the arbitrage courts, um, here we see uh, these are all uh, new buildings of the last decade. Uh, and one of the things that I think is particularly interesting about these arbitrage buildings is that they have, uh, and maybe this is all a, a, in a formalistic way, but they have really paid attention to the, uh, uh, the concerns over envelope passing, about the bribes and that sort of thing. And now every one of these courts that you're looking at is segregated so that there's a whole area that is only open to judges and you have to have passes to be able to get into it. And it, it, in the old days, uh, uh, you used to be able to just wander around and you know you could wander into a judge's chambers and nobody was really paying any attention and now there's it, 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 they, they've at least tried to make it more difficult uh, to do that I'm sure Russians are very we're all uh, creative when we want to bribe people and I'm sure it's still possible to do it but this is interesting because it represents a you know a, 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 a very interesting um, choice in terms of uh, material resources that they put into uh, these buildings um, and we'll see what happens after the, after the big merger. And, uh, and so one of the things that's changed is here we see pictures from the 1990s and in most arbitrage courts you didn't actually have courtrooms that they would hear mm -hmm. cases in their offices, uh, which created a whole you know, set of access issues for, for people like me. But, uh, and they were very cramped. And one of the things that's changed in these new buildings is now you tend to have courtrooms. The arbitrage courts are unlike the courts of general jurisdiction in that all the hearings are now recorded. Um, and this is something that uh, uh, the, the judges like because they use it as a way to protect themselves because one of the things that, that happened when they introduced the qualification commissions, uh, which Maria talked about in terms of the way the judges are elected, but they also deal with disciplinary issues. And so one of the issues that would happen, and, and this is something that I saw very vividly in my field work, is that litigants would literally taunt judges you know, who would try to Dis discipline them in the courtroom and say, you know, where is your evidence? Why didn't you show up with this piece of paper? And they would say something like, you know, hey, you're being a little tough on me. I think I'm going to take that to the qualification commission, right? Um, and now they have uh, this this record. And the, the, the issue that judges had with uh, that kind of taunting was not that they feared that, uh, that, that they were doing something wrong. It was that they feared that they would have to take time away from their already overloaded schedule to go deal with this issue, right? And so it became a very powerful uh, curve in a bad way, you know, sort of on their behavior. Um, and so one of the, <laughs> the issues that we haven't talked very much about or we haven't really thought about, we talked about the large number of cases, but what does this mean for individual judges and how do they deal with this? Um, and we need to start this by realizing that the two main indicators for judges of success or failure in terms of their ability to advance or keep their job or whatever is one, managing their docket, which means resolving the cases within the time periods given in the procedural codes, many of which are extraordinarily short, especially considering that notice is given by mail and the mail pretty much doesn't work. Um, and then the second thing are reversals, right? Mm -hmm. So they don't want to be reversed and they, they need to manage things quickly. And I think all of this, and I'm not going to have time to fully develop this argument, but we can maybe talk about it in the Q&A, creates a very risk-averse uh, judicial core, right? Um, and you know, Maria was talking about the comparisons between Russia and France. We have to remember that, that Russia is part of a civil law heritage, not a common law heritage, and that judges are not really bred for courage or bravery, as she was pointing out, that they are bred for you know, following the rules. Um, and uh, uh, so, so here I wanted to just give you a little bit of data about the, uh, the, the caseload. And the beauty of having done uh, work in the arbitrage courts for so long is I have just tons and tons of data. So here we can see the trajectory of how things are, the number of cases are uh, uh, changing. And then in the far, far, col far column, a percentage of change over time. Uh, and we see here, and this speaks to what Tim was talking about, about the number of cases. Uh, and we see here that the, the number of cases goes up, but the number of judges doesn't go up uh, uh, in, in a similar way. 
And so judges are, are just really, really overloaded uh, uh, with cases. Uh, unfortunately, my, my time in the uh, courts of general, uh, in the general jurisdiction courts is, is shorter, so uh, here I have you know, just a, a quick snapshot of it. Uh, and what we see here is still a huge number of cases. And there are a lot of, of tricks of the trade in terms of how judges manage uh, these cases and how they're able to, to, uh, to get through them. Um, and I'm happy to talk about those if you have questions. And then I wanted to share with you just a few um, uh, snippets from a project I did uh, with focus groups and follow-up interviews, uh, trying to get at how ordinary Russians think about law. And the focus groups were organized around common experiences. So I had a group, uh, a set of, uh, uh, and there were a total of like 30 focus groups in six different parts of Russia. Uh, and they were looking at either home repair projects or personal injury. So it would, I saw these as, as problems where they could be solved by using law and courts, but didn't have to be solved with courts. Um, so then there would be a choice about how to use the law. And so here we see just a couple of, of, of examples. Um, and you know, in some ways, the, the top one there is, is the stereotypical thing we think about Russians with courts. But honestly, if you know the literature on courts anywhere, including in the United States. You know, it doesn't have to be Olga. It could be Tiffany, right? It could be anybody anywhere in the world could have this kind of attitude towards the court. And I think the, the second one uh, was more typical of what I was hearing, because what I would hear is more about just the hassle of going to court, which is, is common everywhere, right? And if we look at the, 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 the um, you know, sort of qualitatively at the sort of hassle that is connected with going to court, uh, I, as someone trained in the American legal system, is struck by how much easier it is to go to court in Russia. But of course, Russians don't have that comparative frame, so uh, to them it seems uh, uh, like a lot of trouble. Um, and then I wanted to just close by sharing some uh, information from a survey that I didn't do, but that, uh, uh, or, or a couple of quantitative projects that were done by Russian um, organizations. Uh, and you know, we start with the recognition that the use of the courts is probably, and, and most representative surveys show this, like you know, 12 to 15 percent of the population uh, has used the courts, and so that's remarkably different than the story of uh, the firms, right? Because I think all the data shows that firms are much more uh, um, aggressive about using the courts than are individuals, and that makes some sense. Uh, so the, because one of the the issues that one has is you can say, okay, we have all this access, but you know, what's, what are people's experiences like, right? Do they, is, is, what's the quality of it? Uh, it's no good to have access if nobody really uh, can use it or, or, or comes away dissatisfied with it. Um, so I think what's interesting here is that we get very high numbers in terms of some of the, the things that, it, you know, it's sort of counterintuitive. Here we have people saying, yeah, I thought that my judge was well-trained and competent. Yeah, I thought that they ruled inside, uh, on the side of the uh, uh, dispute that had the stronger legal position. Um, I thought they were mostly independent, uh, and that's a much higher number than we would ordinarily expect. Um, and uh, when, we asked, when they asked how successful was their experience, uh, the numbers, again, were much higher uh, than, uh, than one would thought. And this sort of ties in with some of the procedural justice literature, which says that if you go to a court, even if you don't win, if you feel like you've been fairly treated, uh, then you tend to come away feeling like, okay, you know, I got a fair shake and be, you know, sort of all right with the experience. And so when we, when I put these results into a just a, a very simple regression, just to look at what are the factors that tend to push uh, uh, um, uh, or to be relevant in terms of uh, 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 feeling like you've been successful, uh, gender always seems to pop out in in these surveys with women being more open to to law and to courts than elsewhere. Um, uh, an openness to uh, being willing to go to court in the future, uh, and not surprisingly, if you're, if you're planning to appeal or you're skeptical of the even-handedness of the court, then you're, you're less uh, uh, kind of happy about how things went for you. Uh, so I'll leave it there and uh, look forward to your questions. Yeah. Um, So hi, all. Sorry I showed up late, but I'm glad that I got to take part in this. Um, if the introduction didn't say it, this is the last event in our Patronage and Corruption series. Um, that was primarily last year, but this was the first time we could get people's schedules together, and then my schedule suddenly changed last week. 
Um, we have a microphone over there, and what I'd like to recommend is that if you have a question, um, please go to the microphone. You can just line up in front of it. Um, please tell us who you are, what your affiliation is, and please ask a question and keep it brief so that we can get lots of people to talk in the small amount of time we have left. Okay, uh, David Fishman with the American Bar Association Section of International Law, Russian Eurasian Law Committee. And the predicate for this question is some work I did last year as a consultant on the Innovation Working Group of the Bilateral Presidential Commission. The question goes to the pending merger of the courts, and starting with Will's presentation, um, I wonder what kind of information we have as to how this is actually going at this point. I was familiar with the uh, letter that the 80 law firms uh, presented about the concerns, which are very widespread, and if if things go badly, the last decade of the arbitrage courts could uh, turn out to be a, you know, a golden age of Russian history to which the time people will look back. On the other hand, it's possible that some of the concerns have been exaggerated. Do we yet know whether the arbitrage courts are going to be subordinate as opposed to merged? In other words, do we know whether they will be continuing to operate the same as they have been in the past with respect to all levels except at the supreme level, which will be a new body which will have one supreme court which will include some or all of the arbitrage court judges and the question of how cases will be assigned in terms of specialization and things of that nature. Um, will and everyone else, how much do we currently have on that topic? Well, I can start the answer. Kathy, I'm sure has um, comments to make as well. I think what we do know is Anton Ivanov, the, um, the head of the arbitration court now, is no longer going to be in charge. Uh, it's Lebedev, the head of the Supreme Court, will be in charge of the new court. Um, we do know that. Um, and I think, as Kathy raised, this, the question of legislative initiative is going to play a big role here. Ivanov has been highly innovative in, um, in, in trying different approaches. And I think, how many commercial court codes have there been? Three, Kathy? Yeah, but I don't think any under his watch. Okay. So there's, so there's been a lot of it. So I think there, there could, I think at least we know the leadership is going to change. And I mean, that, that's something we do know. Otherwise, yeah, a lot's going to remain to be have, to be seen in the course of over the year. Yeah, yeah I don't think, I mean, I, if we were going to see a complete merger of the two courts, which has been discussed, been bandied about for years, somebody would, we would have to be talking about new procedural codes. And I've not seen any discussion of new procedural codes. We enjoy our procedural codes. And so we could not possibly have new courts without new procedural codes. And so I think for now, what we're talking about is the, the merger of the top. And this whole uh, line of argument about the inconsistencies, um, that has less to do with courts at, in the hierarchies and more with the top courts, right? So, um, and to be honest, they really dealt with this issue in 2002 when they uh, changed the jurisdiction of the arbitrage courts to include all kinds of shareholders, because this had been a real problem where you had uh, dual outcomes where individual <coughs> shareholders versus legal entities that were shareholders, and now all that's been consolidated. So it seems to be, everybody agrees it's a, it's a red herring, but um, uh, uh, you know, I, don't, I don't think the devil is in the details, and we don't know the details. Part of it, too, is the training. I mean, you have two very different groups of people. Uh, uh, so, um, you know, if they're doing the same things with a, with a common roof, that's not as bad as if, you know, we see uh, you know, new people brought into those positions, for example. Because there has been resignations, as well, of judges in protest of the uh, potential merger of the courts, too. So it's more than just the law firms that are opposed to this. Do we have other questions? No one else is lined up by the microphone, which is where you need to go if you have a question. <laughs> and again, please identify yourself. Hi, how are you? My name is Alana Tsurbel. I'm an alumni of the Institute from 2001. Um, I actually had the John Hazard Rule of Law Fellow, and I've done a lot of work. <laughs> in rule of law, but actually um, I'm with USAID now, and we were kicked out of Russia, so fun times. But um, I was going to ask, after, actually Catherine Henley, um, you mentioned it's easier to um, go to court in Russia and 
I was just wondering if you could elaborate on that and also talk about the provision of legal aid. Mm -hmm. um, I worked for a little while with Peely, and they have offices mm -hmm. in, in Russia, and they were looking at extending legal aid. And also, I'm just wondering if anyone has done studies on if there's more politicization in regional courts, like in the caucuses, versus you would think that there would be in other areas. Thank you. Um, well, the, the ease of going to court has a lot to do with what are the requirements. Um, and as anyone who has gone to court in the United States knows, you know, there's a certain kind of paper you have to use, all kinds of rules. It's endless. Uh, and uh, in Russia, you know, I remember when I was doing, even back in the Soviet days, my dissertation was on labor law, and I remember these complaints that said, I was fired, it was wrong. <laughs> Done. That's the whole complaint. And so. That's, that's going, you know, that's, that's a low bar. And, uh, um, and I think what I've seen in, the, uh, in my, my field work is that <clears throat> there's a, almost a pride in the openness of the courts and um, uh, a desire to take almost any complaint rather than sending it back. I mean, there's an a institutional uh, incentive for taking it because you have to send it back, you have to explain why you're sending it back. And if you take it, then you can deal with them when they get there. Um, as to the representation, uh, the reality is is that a lot of people are not represented in courts, and judges are um, uh, uh, more open to helping. And this raises a question of even-handedness. Uh, that when I would talk to judges and uh, you know raise the issue of whether or not a uh, person that is has a better lawyer should win simply because they have the better lawyer, the person that kind of doesn't know what they're doing you know, should fall by the wayside. And those of us trained in American law school, I mean, that's how we make our money, right? That's, that's the whole deal. And they were just horrified by this idea. And so uh, their, their thought is, is that, that they have to help explain. Uh, now, in, in Maria's book, one of the points that I'll let her talk about this as well, one of the things that she talks about is the pro Nichasi and the question of whether or not having these times where people can come in and talk to judges is a, you know, a, a moment for corruption or whether it's an educational moment. I think the goal is for it to be an educational moment. Um, and the, the question of, of expanding legal aid, uh, I think one of the blankest spots of all of what we know about Russia is the legal profession. Right? I think we just do not know very much about it. And I did a series of focus groups with lawyers where you know, I went in with all my theoretical models and about lawyers as gatekeepers and all kinds of things that you get out of the, the uh, associate legal literature. And you know, they just didn't know what I was talking about. You know, they take all cases. Right? Mm -hmm. they, they, they pay, their, their fee schedule is determined by how many times they go to court. I and mean, this is a very different model. And it's a model that, that, that almost pushes you into court once you, once you once you've uh, uh, been unable to handle it through negotiation, right? Um, and so whether there's, and I was never clear on the value added sometimes, especially in the, in the smaller cases. And I think one of the things I've seen over the, you know, the 10 or uh, 15 years that I've been working in the arbitrage court is just a tremendous uh, increase, especially in Moscow and St. Petersburg, in terms of the quality of lawyering, right? And that's something where you see tremendous variation in the regions, so. I don't know whether you wanted to talk about the Prio Michasi or... Um, you don't have to. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that uh, it's a very interesting point about uh, differences in politicization um, across different regions. And actually the um, expanded defamation data set that I, that I have will, will actually allow uh, me to try to check that. So I'll, I'll take the suggestion and let you know when I have some results. Um, yeah, I can talk to a little bit about the politicization of courts across regions. Um, I edited a, a special double issue of post-Soviet affairs um, that will come out, I think, electronically in February and then in paper in May. Um, and it's all, the four of the papers are on various aspects of economic coercion in law. And one of the papers l does a study of uh, hostile takeovers is reported in the press, these are often public events, uh, from 2000 to 2010 across regions within Russia. And he, uh, Mikhail Roklitz, who's uh, um, a, a postdoctoral fellow at uh, a center I'm, I'm helping out with in, in, at the High School of Economics in Moscow, and he finds um, uh, some in interesting temporal and geographic variation. 
So one of the things he finds is that initially there were lots of hostile takeovers over in big industrial plants uh, in probably 2003 to 2006, and then it shifts to smaller uh, uh, firms, retail service uh, kinds of firms. Uh, also some shifts across regions over time. The, the one of the interesting findings that he has is that in regions where uh, the vote for United Russia was especially high, the likelihood of a hostile takeover is higher. <laughs> so his view is that there's some, possibly some exchange going on because the often local and regional governmental officials are involved in these hostile takeovers uh, in one way or another. And it might be that in exchange for political support, they're given a, a, a freer hand. So I put a plug out there for that special issue because I think it's something that people want to read and from Mikhail's work. So. Hi, <coughs> Austin Long, Columbia University. Uh, first, I want to thank the panel. Those were all great presentations. You've done a very good job convincing me that when the stakes are low, the judicial system works pretty well, right? Whether it's the center doesn't care or you're at the justice of the peace level, but I want to press on the hostile takeover point. Yeah. It, I mean, your data alone was a, a bit disheartening, but I wonder if given the points you made earlier about how to be an entrepreneur in Russia, you have to be pretty high morale to begin with, yeah. that a lot of those people that said it's not very likely yeah. were actually underweighting their chances. Oh, yeah. So I wonder if, yeah. if you know, if any or, you know, Tim particularly, but any of the panel could talk a little more about how, how much of a problem is this? Because yeah. it, it strikes me as bad and maybe even worse yeah, I mean, than we, we think. You know, when we do surveys, we know that there's all kinds of issues with response bias. Uh, but we can often figure out the direction uh, uh, that the bias is in. And I think the bias is clearly in understating uh, uh, this, this type of uh, uh, activity. Also, um, there's two other studies, one from 2009 and one from 2007 that shows some, um, uh, actually one I did in 2008 shows higher levels as well. And there one interpretation is that uh, um, you know, once firms get taken over, uh, they often get taken over by stronger groups that are better able to defend them. Uh, uh, so you know, you might, in, when I'm doing a survey, uh, you're getting some survivor bias in that if at the end of the day all the firms get taken over, uh, you know, your sample, the, the, the firms that are the likely targets just drop out. That's one uh, 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 possibility. Another is that, you know, firms are directing, uh, are developing new strategies for trying to prevent uh, this kind of activity. Um, one of my, my colleagues has been studying this group called Business Against uh, Corruption, and one of the things that they do is take complaints from businesses that have been the targets of hostile takeovers, and they go public with them. Uh, and they uh, appeal to the ombudsman, and they have a formal process for trying to deal with them. That's not, that's not through the courts, um, but it's through really you know, politics and trying to, trying to sort it out. So um, you know, I think the numbers are certainly higher uh, 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 than I state, and you know, to, it takes a brave soul to be a business person in, in, uh, in, in Russia. That's, that's also an understatement. So. Yeah. You know, it, it, the trend line is really difficult. I, now I've done these surveys, you know, in, in eight regions four times, and it's since it's not a, we're not interviewing the same people, um, it's it's hard to really draw comparisons over time. Also, the political climate is changing, so people might have been more willing to express dissatisfaction in an earlier period, whereas in a later period they might be more likely to uh, uh, hide. The, uh, hide their complaints. So I'm, I'm pretty confident in when you make comparisons within one, a single survey about relationships, but I'm less confident about making claims uh, over time. So. Hi, I'm Katharina Pisto. I teach here at um, Columbia Law School. Let me just be a little bit facetious and ask, you know, then what really has changed since the Soviet times? Because we do have evidence from the Soviet times that under certain conditions, the courts and arbitration tribunals worked quite well. There's this wonderful study, and I forgot the author from the 1960s who sent, yeah, exactly. He, sent it, he sat in the courtrooms in St. Petersburg and observed divorces and small little claims, and it seemed to be incredibly boring and very, very normal. And so if that is what the Russian tradition is, then we shouldn't expect much, much change. Um, so, so I think there, there's a methodological question here, you know, what is our implicit 
benchmark or bottom line and what are the right comparative cases. So I found some of the data that Anna brought about about Ukraine quite interesting, so that they're sort of intuitively interesting. I'd, I'd like to see more about that. But clearly the United States won't be our bottom line, but there's, there's something else going on here, and I'm glad that Delphine joined me at the microphone, otherwise I would have made the point that I hope she's making. We have to think about the population of, of um, lit potential litigants that are using Russian courts at all, rather than going elsewhere. Um, so what is actually the crop of disputes that even make it at all to Russian courts because some might have just completely opted out of the system, right? And, and that I think is something to, to think about as well because we make some implicit assumption that that is the major dispute resolution mechanism in society and people should use it. So we have to know a little bit more than just the informal or the security services for the commercial business. We have to think about arbitration and we have to think about complete opt-outs. Why don't you follow mine? Well, I, I just wanted to comment on that. I don't. I can't speak for everybody, but I certainly don't think that the courts are the first place you go. I mean, yeah. that's. And I don't think I've ever said that in any of my work. And one of the reasons why I did the project with the focus groups and then the follow-up interviews is to try to get a, you know, a, a, not a representative, but some kind of sense of of how people talk about dealing with problems and. In the, the survey work that I did with Peter Morrell and Randy Reiterman, I mean, we ended up finding that of all the non-payment cases, like 1% ended up in court, which is not that different than what you'd see in other places. So there's no bias here that, that we're saying that. And I completely agree with you that we need to be quite open to all kinds of, of uh, uh, ideas of dispute resolution. But I think one of the things that is striking in the mainline literature, not the people who write about law, is that there's an assumption that courts are just not an option. Yeah, and that no. simply is not but, true. Uh, but what, what I'm basically suggesting um, is maybe you're just using a st straw man which sort of disguises what we should really be doing, sort of looking into the subtleties and nuances of the operation of the Russian legal system because, I mean, this, so this caricature of everything is corrupt and it's still red telephone kind of thing is, is, is really un unhelpful. I agree with that completely and I think... But well, I don't think it's a straw man if it's the, if it's the common I wisdom see. within okay. the literature. I mean, I don't... Okay. The, the rea I would love if it, if it was a straw man, right? If we could get people to stop writing these pieces that assume that nobody's using the courts. And I take your point about the, the Pfeiffer thing, you know, but the, and I don't think you can talk just about the Soviet period. I think it's true of the Tsarist period as well. And in the book I'm writing now, I mean, I make that argument is that there's a line that goes through here, but in all of those periods, in different ways, we have been unwilling in a, in a you know, sort of in a big way to recognize that there is this other story of law. And that's, that's the only point that I was trying to make, not that that's the whole story, but that we just need to have more um, of that. Can I just jump in quickly, too? I think another difference with the Soviet period would be, and during the Soviet period, constitutional relationships didn't really matter a great deal because the party, of course, was extra-constitutional. And now, I think, you know, the structural relationships, they're not normally litigated in court, but the structural relationships between different institutions actually really matters. And there's a real attention to the formal detail of that. Like if you look at the 92, 93 drafting period, the, what they're fighting over is the structure. You know, how are these institutions going to be related to each other? They're less interested in the rights provisions, but they're really interested in the formal provisions there. So and I think that is a real difference and something that we're seeing that's different than from the, um, than from the Soviet period. Delphine Nougarhead, I am um, a visiting scholar at the law school, and I was also the head of DLA Piper's corporate M&A practice in Moscow oh, for approximately eight years. Um, I actually appeared in arbitrage courts myself because there's an important thing that I think and Kathy implied it, is you can actually go to an arbitrage court without a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And this explains to a large extent why it is actually used in practice. Now my question is the following, and I do want to just thank the panel for keeping Russia on the, the radar screen of, of, Russia, of American academia. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful, and thank you. And I also want to thank uh, Kathy in particular for being the, um, the defender of the Russian courts and, uh, and trying to combat this idea of lawlessness and, you know, all is lost. Um, now, I do want to make one point. Um, my practice is that the arbitrage courts are used very frequently for small disputes. And in none of your statistics did you actually give information on the, on the quantum of the disputes that are heard. The experience is that they are usually quite low. Um, there is usually a very strong accounting and tax reason to go to court. If you want to be able to deduct a loss or a receivable that's not being paid, you have to go to court. 
So there are, these are mundane reasons that keep a churn of activity in the courts of low, low level. Mm -hmm. Now, the question I want to ask is the following. Uh, when we talk about the, the Russian um, courts as an alternative to other dispute resolution mechanisms, the real alternative today is the London High Court. It's arbitration at LCIA. It's Stockholm Chamber of Commerce. Um, all of the important disputes in Russian business are heard outside of the Russian court system. They're heard in, in these foreign venues. Uh, perhaps one of the members of the panel could comment on this and um, what is the implication on the level of trust that senior Russian economic elites have in their own courts? Why is this happening and is it going to continue to happen? Well, I have a paper where I look at the question of whether the relationship between trust and use, right? Because in the economics literature, there's certainly a lot of dismissal of the courts because we know that you know, people believe that they can't get their property rights defended. And one of the things I found was is there really is no relationship between trust and use, right? And I think this goes to your point about a lot of it is just churning kind of stuff and, uh, um, and uh, very low level. And you know, there's a wonderful piece about the US system at the turn of the century called the routinization of debt collection. Uh, where they, we used to have this sort of thing and then eventually people realized that there were you know, better things to do with your time and more efficient ways to handle basic debt collection. And the question is whether or not we're seeing that kind of institutional process in Russia. Um, now as to your point about the use of uh, foreign uh, and uh, kind of private uh, uh, commercial arbitration, um, uh, you're talking there about a, 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 you know, a pretty distinct and small subset of of what's going on in Russian business, the people that even are aware of of those of, of those fora, and I think one thing is is that uh, 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 the distrust is even more profound among foreign businessmen of Russian courts than among Russian businessmen, right? And a lot of uh, my guess is a lot of the cases that you're thinking of would have maybe not all. I, I I take that. I mean, certainly the stuff that's been going on in London is definitely Russian Russian. Uh, so. Uh, um, uh, but I, I'm not sure that if we would look at the most important, because I teach contract law, and one of the things that we know is that a lot of business disputes also don't go through the courts in other countries. They tend to go through private arbitration for confidentiality reasons, for maybe for speed reasons, for lots of reasons, right? And then the question is, you know, how, how unusual is Russia? Uh, and then when we look at other countries like Russia that are in the transitional or hybrid or uh, not fully developed kind of thing, you know, the, the distrust of their courts is, uh, Russia's not unique in that respect. Um, uh, so, and it certainly costs a lot more to use those courts than it does to use the Russian arbitrage courts, so that's, that would also be a limiting factor for some in terms of using them. So, um, those are just random thoughts, but. Well, please join me in thanking the panel for a wonderful set of presentations. Thank you.